Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, NEPM's Jill Kaufman joins us to chat about the proposed controversial book removal policy in Ludlow. There's a school board meeting about it a week from tonight. We'll get her take on where that might lead. And we'll talk with a recently frequently banned author from Florence, Mass., Jarrett J. Krasoska. Strawberry season is upon us, and we'll get to picking the ripest, juiciest ones we can find with Kristen Sykes and Fred Bettel from Pie in the Sky Farm in Northampton and Phil Corman from CESA. Are strawberries the best berry? Are they even a berry? According to Betsy, are... They're not, because the not seeds a, are on the outside. Yeah, that's huge. But anyway, come on, we've got to call them <laughs> strawberries. Are strawberries the best berry, or is there a better berry? And apart from fresh off the vine, got a favorite strawberry recipe to share? Email thefab413 at nepm.org or text us 1-800-639-9120. And we were supposed to talk to the folks from Holyoke Queer Prom today, but something came up last second. That being said, having fun and safe prom alternatives is what we are all about. Did you do something as an alternative to prom? Send us your most memorable prom moments. Email thefab413 at nepm.org or text us one 800 639 And right now we're in the studio with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. Since 2019, they've installed and restored 25 murals. Commonwealth Murals helped found the Community Mural Institute, an intensive training for artists and emerging muralists to learn techniques for community-engaged mural creation. The CMI includes classroom instruction and hands-on training, networking, and establishing mur- uh, with established muralists and supplemental training opportunities for the participants. 60% of CMI artists are BIPOC and 60% are women. Commonwealth Murals is also behind Fresh Paint Springfield, an annual mural festival bringing neighborhood-specific fine art to diverse neighborhoods across Springfield. Each year, in each neighborhood chosen, at least one mural is created using a unique process which engages a community group in guiding the theme of the mural and engages the whole community in the mural pa- painting process during free and accessible paint parties. Britt Ruth, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. (laughs) We miss walking into work and seeing the work of Fresh Paint, which you could, is all along Worthington Street in Springfield in all of its glory, but we used to pass that on the way to the old NEPM studios, and now it's, I mean, we still have a mural from Fresh Paint literally outside of NEPM, but it's not quite the same as seeing like four of them at once. Yeah, (laughs) and it's really striking to have so many and so many big ones in such uh, like a tight little location there. But apart from Worthington Street, which we've mentioned in Springfield, where are some other places where we can see the murals that you and Commonwealth Murals have been working on? So uh, we do love all the murals on Worthington Street. I think we should do some down here on this end, too. I'm for it. To complement the beautiful mural done by Wayne One, which is the one you see out your front door. Um, We have been doing murals in Mason Square, in the South End, in the North End. And this year for the first, we're stretching into Indian Orchard this year. Next year, we'll get into Forest Park. So we're really trying to go everywhere. We believe in murals everywhere. Why? Why are murals an important thing for a community? Murals are such a powerful tool for activating a space. Murals can tell the stories of the people who have been there in the past, the people who are there now. It can seed hopes and dreams for the future. Murals change the way people experience and view a space. And if you think about all the history of big images in our community, they're advertising, they're basically just advertising or we have some public art that's like statues and they're old, uh, white men from our history. Um, but that's not who Springfield is now. That's not the community that we have here. And so we really try to work within each neighborhood to tell the stories of that neighborhood so people can say, this is me. I live here. This is my community. So in addition to murals that are just are done by artists who come in, get a real feel for the community and create art, we also try to engage community in thinking about what do you want this mural to be about? Uh, And then we have them come in and paint. How did you get involved in organizing mural painting and, and, and murals in general? They seem like such a large endeavor to have that big a canvas to work with, even when you're bringing in community volunteers. Yes, and community volunteers, many hands don't really make lighter work when you're doing (laughs) murals, but it's totally worth it, totally worth it. And I am not an artist myself, and I grew up in Western Mass, up in the Amherst area, with no visual public art at all. And it took going all the way to Barcelona on a solo vacation 
The first day I went on like a walking tour of street art and I fell in love with it and became completely obsessed and spent four days just wandering the streets of Barcelona, learned like soaking in as much as I could. So then I came back and I was like, okay, where's the street art in Massachusetts? Went out finding it. I was like out digging around old buildings to see like the hidden graffiti spots and driving around. And then I saw a post on Facebook about a mural festival in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And it was happening that day. It was a Sunday morning. I just happened to have nothing to do. I rolled out of bed. I got in my car. I drove there. I got there at like 930 in the morning. <laughs> Nobody was painting because they had had a late night event the night before. So I just wandered around, and then I bumped into these two guys who also happened to be from Spain, Pichiavo, amazing um, muralists, that were up early because they had to leave. So I sat and watched them all day. These two artists, they work together, and they're like one creative mind and two bodies, and they and they're, were painting on the side of an apartment building. And I watched it transform the space. And I came back three days in a row just sat there and watched, and watched the way the neighborhood interacted with them, the way they felt about it. It was incredible. And on the third day, I thought, I could figure out how to do this. Like, I got my MBA, and I'm good at organizing things and raising money and, you know, project planning. I'm going to learn how to do this. So I did. I started talking to mural festival organizers and put together a fancy, shiny PowerPoint <laughs> and um, came to Springfield and pitched it. And they said, you know, I think now's the right time. We're in. So that is the story. We're speaking with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. And Kalise and I have said how much we've enjoyed the murals on Worthington Street, which we haven't really described for people who haven't seen them. So tell us what some of these murals you've done. What did we say? 25 uh, restored and installed murals so far since 2019? It's actually 45. Wow. wow. The 25 are murals that we've done in collaboration with the community. I okay. see. So, um so there's so many. Um, <laughs> so there is a the one that we see that is one of the most striking yes. on one side of Worthington Street on the Dewey's building yes. is the Black Lives Matter mural, as I have called it, which says Black Lives Matter in a banner at the bottom. But that kind of happened yes. even separately than the creation of the mural itself, you yes. were saying. So that mural, the Black Lives Matter mural, was done by 16 local artists. And then the, the mural that's on top of it was done by Jeff Enriquez from Brooklyn. And it tells the story. It poses a question to the community, which is... What, would, what could art have been like if it had been fine art, had been accessible to people of color in Europe back in the day, like in the 1800s? So you have, or 1700s, 1600s. So you have a young black girl who's his niece dressed in the clothing of European royalty. And in one hand, she's holding a, like the old fashioned paint palette. And in the other hand, she's holding a spray can. And her canvas is behind her, and it's got all these graffiti-style lettering. Because he's also asking the question or making a statement that graffiti is an art form and should be held in equal esteem with fine art. So all that's in the story. It says Worthington, worthy down the side, which is after the street, but also to say she too is worthy. Mm. And then she's pointing her spray can down towards the Black Lives Matter mural as, as tribute to that. It's great. Yeah. And then across the street, there is one that does feel a little more advertising. Is that still part of the um, the Commonwealth murals? Although it seems like hearkening back to advertisements of, of days gone by. Yeah, that's a beautiful one that was done really recently. And it was not done by Commonwealth uh -huh. murals, actually. It was done by another organization called City Mosaic. Mm -hmm. And they restored the advertising that was on that building, I think, in the 1950s. It was a Photoshop. So uh, they restored all of that. It was done by John Simpson, who is right now doing another mural on the other side of uh, that building, right oh. there on Bridge Street. Oh, cool. So. What's <laughs> exciting about driving around Springfield and getting yeah. to know it better, because I live in Turner's Falls, which we'll get yeah. to in a little bit. <laughs> um, and even in Northampton, there's not that many public murals where I spent a great deal of time over the last 20 years. But like, you know, I'll, I'll turn a corner and then all of a sudden there's a huge mur mural that pops up. And it's really exciting. And we're speaking with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. And I know that um, in Holyoke, there are these great murals, too, large-scale mm -hmm. murals, celebrating a lot of the Puerto Rican heritage of, uh, of, Puerto of Holyoke right now. And I know that some of the conversations around these murals always lead to controversy. Whenever you're trying to please different portions of the community in a neighborhood at the same time, it can be controversial. 
how does Commonwealth Murals navigate through these community conversations and come to a conclusion that at least, uh, hopefully, most of the people feel <laughs> feel okay about? Yeah. I mean, it's art. Art is going to be controversial, and we're not really doing our job if everyone is super comfortable with everything we do. I mean, that said, we are trying to create murals that are going to be beloved by the community. Um, so that kind of, which is why we love to do community engaged murals. So we will start with um, a listening session. So I'll tell you about a mural we're doing. We're starting right now, and we're going to have a community paint party on Friday. So we where is that community paint party if people want to get involved? It's for Bernie Avenue in Springfield All from right. four to six on Friday. No experience necessary. Anyone and everyone can do. You do not need experience. And I will say, the first time I did a paint party, it's a giant color by numbers on mural fabric that we put on tables so you don't have to get on a ladder i mixed up 13 and 31 and painted the wrong color wow. in all these spots and now i run them so <laughs> anyone can do it you don't even I need promise. to be able to count exactly <laughs> exactly so uh, but that mural we held listening sessions um with a group of youth in the youth build program which is a fabulous program that i recommend you guys learn about um, and we talked about moments of hardship in their life and who was it in their immediate surroundings that helped them in those moments and uh, what helped them was there a resource or a church or something in their community and also what did they learn about themselves so we have this conversation with them and this larger theme of overcoming hardship and community supporting each other was actually drawn from another listening session we did earlier in a, like a month before in the neighborhood so we get all this input from them. They tell these amazing stories. And, we, and then we ask, what do you want to see? What don't you want to see? And then we're working with a fabulous mural, muralist, Greta McLean from Good Space Murals, who is also the co-facilitator of the Community Mural Institute. So she designs it. All of the people pictured in the mural are from the North End. Um, one of them is a man named Jeffet Robles, who was an amazing community organizer, um, who was tragically killed a couple of years ago. So he's in there as kind of a role model inspiration, and then other people who have been identified, young people, as kind of role models. So they're all, we take their pictures, they're all in the mural. So when you embed that deeply, people can really relate to it. And there, there's going to be somebody who doesn't like it, somebody who might say, you know what, that person up there that you're celebrating, they're not perfect. <laughs> and then I would say, Show me a perfect person, especially <laughs> any of the perfect, you know, any of the people we celebrate in our public art. Um, and, you know, we'll do a mural of them. <laughs> but uh, this is about us, right? It's about celebrating our humanity and mm -hmm. saying you too can, are worthy. You too are worthy of celebration. And we're going to, like, hold these people up and these stories up. Just like the person on the Worthy Mural on Worthington Street in Springfield, right around the corner from these stations. And we're talking with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. And we're going to take a break and more about how I'm going to have to fully disclose, at least to a certain extent, about how Commonwealth Murals may be expanding apart from the neighborhood I'm working in to closer to the neighborhood where I live. And about how I found out about your work. Okay, to I want to hear about that. Yeah, you're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Kalise Smith. And we're here with Britt Rue from Commonwealth Murals, which is super exciting and Fresh Paint Springfield. And I mentioned that I would say how I found out about your work, and it's the Nelson Stevens exhibit. There are several Nelson Stevens murals in Springfield, but your organization is the one that came in and restored them because they had been let's say aged. <laughs> they had been whitewashed, destroyed, lost. Yeah. So let's just take a beat and say Nelson Stevens was a genius of an artist and a community organizer and a teacher. And there's a beautiful exhibit of his work at the Springfield Museums through the summer that I highly recommend. Um, More on that story next week on the show. Well, Indeed. there you go. <laughs> so Nelson Stevens uh, was one of the founding members of AfriCobra, which is the longest running black arts organization in the country. 
And he um, joined in Chicago and then came to this area to teach at UMass. And he, one of the tenets of Africobra was that it was art for the people, not for the critics. And a lot of members did this by, uh, kind of fulfilled this part of their manifesto by um, creating posters of their work and distributing them or selling them very affordably. And then some uh, did murals. Uh, um, Nelson did many murals. He was the only, and Springfield was the only place that was home to a whole collection of murals done in the Afrocobra aesthetic. So he uh, got federal work study money to pay students to paint murals over the summer decades before anybody was thinking of doing that or doing art uh, murals as placemaking. So Springfield had 37 murals that were done through his program. Um, most were done by his students, but four were done by him. They're all gone. They've been lost to, the, to time. Some were intentionally taken down. Some were just lost because the buildings came down or they were done on walls that were redone. So there was a couple, there are a couple that were still left, but not any that he designed. So we began working with him a couple years ago to restore two of the murals that he painted that were gone. So we tracked down pictures of them, and we did this through our Community Mural Institute. So we started by tracing every line, dot, and color on, from a photograph and making a digital file color coding all of it, turning the whole thing, both of them. Making it clear when it says 13 versus 31. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they just didn't allow me to paint. Okay. <laughs> That's not true. I insisted. <laughs> but, uh, they checked. They were checking as I was doing it. Um, we held paint parties. We had about 300 people that came, many people who came um, because they knew him. And tragically, he passed away two months before we started this project because he was going to be here doing it with us. Mm. Um, but it became really a tribute to him and his legacy and his work. So uh, the community painted. We had a team of 15 artists that were working ridiculous hours to get them up in two weeks. And now, now we have the tribute to black women and the wall of black music, which are both restored to the Mason Square community. We also got a hot tip that there is going to be another mural in Mason Square that will feature the Personage, personage and work of a guest we had on last week of the show. Yes. Another amazing Mason Square resident, mm -hmm. Ruth Carter. She grew up in Mason Square. The only black woman, well, you know all this because you're on the show, only black woman to win two Oscars. And I think I read the only person to win two Oscars in the same category ever. Maybe. I think the Tom only Hanks woman. has won I best only Oscar woman. And, uh, Okay, we're going yeah, to look, we're gonna have to look that up. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I probably am misspeaking, <laughs> but she's fabulous, yes. as you know. And so we are going to be working with her to do a mural to talk about her legacy, the evolution of her design work, uh, her connection to Springfield, and also a look at the Afrofuturism of the design work she's doing now. We'll be doing it in this community-engaged fashion. Um, so she, we will have a community paint party, which she will be there. And then we'll be, it'll be up by the end of the summer. We're going to come to that yeah, one. Yeah, for sure. We yeah. can't miss that one. No, you can't miss we're, that one. Uh, we're speaking with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. Now, we've talked about almost all of the murals, I think, that we've talked about so far are based in Springfield. Is Springfield the only community that you've worked with? Oh, no. No, we've done murals in Fitchburg. We've run the Community Mural Institute in Fitchburg, and we're running one in North Carolina right now. We have murals in Chicopee and some other towns that I'm... Belchertown, I know oh, you've gosh. done. Oh, gosh. Sorry, Belchertown. <laughs> we love that mural. And we just did an amazing skateboard paint party and graffiti jam in Belchertown last Saturday, a couple days ago. Um, which was super great. So, yes, Belchertown. Our engineer, Betsy, just, like, threw her arms up. And, she's from and Belchertown. She, she's in Belchertown. <laughs> Sorry, Betsy. No, she's nah. real excited. <laughs> but it was awesome. And We're I'm excited. Do... And this is the full disclosure part of the conversation with Britt Rue of Commonwealth Murals. Uh, the Shea Theater, nonprofit community-owned theater in the town of Montague. I make zero dollars from it, but I'm the president of the board. Commonwealth Murals is doing a exploratory committee or something along those lines to see if the Shea would be the home of one of your large scale murals sometime in the near future. Yes, we're excited. I'm, it's perfect. I think um, it's a beautiful wall. We love the Shea. And I think when you do a really professional large scale, scale mural as the first mural in a community, there are some other murals there, but not of this scale. When you do it really good, when you hit it out of the park, it's like a rising tide that raises all boats. 
people are like, oh, so that's what we could do. Like, oh, we want more of this. Are there other effects that you see in communities once they get murals, like things that just kind of ripple out and change when art enters your world on a daily sort of basis? It's a great point. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I love murals because it's bringing art out into the community because we often don't go out of our way to go to a gallery or an art museum. They're not always in spaces that feel particularly accessible to everyone. And when you're bringing it out onto the street, you're seeing, like you guys, you were seeing that one mural every day. And you were seeing it when you were happy or when you were stressed or in the winter or in the summer. Like you, you develop a relationship with a piece of art, which how awesome is that? <laughs> um, so I think that that's part of the effect that's hard to measure. We just hear anecdotally. Um, but it also helps um, people take pride in their neighborhood for it usually it can draw investment. So people say, we need to have this big mural. We should put lights. Oh, we have lights there. Maybe we should put some other lights. Maybe we should string some lights across. Uh -huh. oh, that looks so beautiful. So, nice. yeah. so it, you know, it draws <laughs> others. It's like a magnet mm. that draws in care and attention. That's wonderful. Britt Rue from Commonwealth Murals. Tell us one more time about the paint party that's happening on Friday. Yeah, so the mural I just told you about with the youth and this beautiful story, that's the mural we're all going to be painting on Friday. So we turn the whole thing to a giant paint by numbers on mural fabric. It's from 4 to 6 at the New North Citizens Council Youth Build Building on 4 Bernie Ave, which has a big mural on it also that we did last year featuring two of the students and teachers of Youth Build. And that's right here in Springfield. Britt Ruth, thank you so much. It was super fun to be here. Thank you. Yay! Coming up, Kristen Sykes and Fred Bedall from Pie in the Sky Farm in Northampton. We're picking strawberries. Are strawberries the best berry? Or is there a better berry? And apart from Fresh Off the Vine, got a favorite strawberry recipe to share? Email the fab 413 at nepm.org or text us 1-800-639-9120. And we were supposed to talk to the folks from Holyoke Queer Prom today, but an emergency happened last second. That being said, having fun and safe prom alternatives is what we are all about. Did you do something as an alternative to prom? Send us your most memorable moments regarding those. Email the fab 413 at nepm.org or text us 1-800-639-9120. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Kristen Sykes, do you always dress like a strawberry, or is this just for the radio? I always dress like a strawberry when it's strawberry season. Nice. And I never knew how many garments you could purchase that have strawberries on them. Yeah. It's really actually hard to find ones with blueberries. If you wear too much of the blue, you look like Violet Beauregard from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Absolutely. So. Violet, you're turning violet, Violet! I do my hair purple and blue during blueberry season. Yeah, because your hair so does, is kind of reddish pink fuchsia now. pink now, yeah. I always wonder if it's too much, but you'll appreciate this too, Monty. It's never enough. It's never enough. <laughs> never enough. <laughs> Any excuse to get to dress up in fun wild outfits is a good enough excuse for me. Yes. We were fortunate last year to have Congressman McGovern, who I know you know well. He's always wearing his he, silly congressman outfits. He wore a silly congressman <laughs> outfit and he came and um, did a tour of our farm. We had cake and beer afterwards. Wow, that's good. That sound in the background, you can imagine it's the ocean. But it's 91. It's the highway. The rolling sounds of trucks and cars going by, but right next to the highway is what you're saying, Kristen, at Pie in the Sky Farm might be the largest contiguous farmland in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Absolutely, right on the Connecticut River with the view of the Holyoke Range. That's amazing. Like, I drive by this all the time, but I don't think about it as being that big of a farmland. But how big are we talking about? We have eight and a half acres, and it's protected under the state agricultural protection program. So that's how we were able to afford the farmland. So thanks to your tax dollars at work. <laughs> but to answer your question, it's a thousand acres. A thousand acres of continuous farmland. Yeah. And that's Fred Badal, also from Pine in the Sky Farm. It's a local hero spotlight with Phil Corman from CISA, the local hero folks. And Kalise and I are here for our first taste of strawberries. Strawberries. Woo! As much as I love 
Woo! Straw babies, as my siblings used to call them. Cute. Yeah. Or you can tell if somebody's from the Philadelphia or uh, South Jersey area if they call them strawberries and oh, add an extra L in there. That's always the tell. Drink them with some water. <laughs> I'm from Philly, so. so. Did you say strawberries? <laughs> no, I say strawberries. Okay, did you have to relearn that? Absolutely. Just like <laughs> I had to learn there's no H in Amherst. And there's somehow two H sounds in Northampton, but only one H. <laughs> It's earlier than I usually think of strawberry season popping, but uh, we've already seen people here, even a CISA board member, already here picking strawberries this morning. These guys open up at 8 o'clock, and it's almost like yard sales. People are right here at 8 a.m. to get their quarts. <laughs> but also, nobody wants to pick in the heat, so come early so that you don't have to like work up a sweat. Tell us how things have been going strawberry season early on 2023 here. It's been great. We heard a lot of sad tales at the Asparagus Festival and prior to that about the frost that came three weeks ago and what it meant for specifically fruits. A lot of blueberries lost, a lot of apples lost, peaches were already lost. What about strawberries, Kristen? The strawberries are going great. We're like avidly watching the weather mm. and you know when there's a frost advisory we come out and put this little blanket on it, row cover, and that really helps uh, just give us a couple extra degrees to give a little warmth to the strawberries. So, so far they're, they're doing well and we have blueberries that'll be ready in July and those seem like they're doing well as well. We're in a little bit of a warm pocket here in between the Holyoke Range and the freeway so it gives us a little extra cover. Many people haven't ever been out here maybe they've been as far as the airport or the fairgrounds but never come all the way out into the Northampton Meadows which is a really special place. So we added you cut flowers last year and so this year we're going to have over 90 varieties of dahlias and several other flowers so you can pick yourself a bouquet. Looking at the Holyoke Range doesn't get any better than that. Also your lupins are gorgeous. Yeah you should go and smell them they have like this amazing little spicy scent to them. It's so cool. People can smell. Kristen's one of the few who can smell them. You can smell lupin? I can smell the lupin. It's a nice little spicy scent. I want to test that out now. You should test it out. I'm about to plant some in my garden. So you said this is your fifth season here? It's our fifth season. What were you doing before this? Well, Farmer Fred's been farming for 25 years. I've done a lot of damage around the valley here. I, I, I've been uh, fired or let go from many farms in the valley. <laughs> Do we want to hear one of those fun tales? Uh, no, no, that's okay. all right. And what about you, Kristen? Um, well, I've spent my whole life working in conservation, so I worked for the Appalachian Mountain Clubs for 18 years, and I just started a new job a couple months ago working for the National Parks Conservation Association, so working to protect national parks. Yay! I love it. And Fred already ruined my vacation along the National Seashore on the Cape because he's watching the weather so intently, saying that we're going to be in this weather pattern while I'm on the Cape, so it's going to still be cold. I haven't worn a sweater in June. Come on! There's something special about going to the beach in sweaters, though. Not when you want to be going swimming in the beach. Look. You know, New Englanders are tough. Yeah. So it can be pouring rain and it can be freezing, and they are going to pick their two quarts of strawberries. That's true, even though you're from Philly, right? I'm a New Englander now. Uh, I think people will take umbrage with that. We, I'm we, not one of those people. We bought the farm. So. <laughs> I'm so sorry for your loss. So I, I know that pie in the sky is such a great name, both because you come here, you pick your berries and you make your pie. But I also think of it as like you both have very high ideals about and vision about what you want this farm to be and how you want the world to change. And I'd love you to be a little more explicit about what we're looking at, how you're farming and all of that. Yeah, well, should we go for a walk and go to the fields and yeah, yeah we'll walk and talk. Well. Monty, in answer to your question, I don't know if your microphone catches the fact that we have a little bit of a treble soundtrack here to match the, uh, the bass line of the freeway, which is the sounds of crickets and birds. I thought it might be the sound of the electric fence that we were walking toward there. Maybe <laughs> it had like a high-pitched frequency that only children can hear. Exactly. We have to keep the children out. Yeah. No, that's, that's not true. But yeah, so we, uh, we try to have uh, a lot of habitat areas for the bees and the birds. And I can definitely hear them. And, you know, it's a, they're not our enemies, they're our friends. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of room on this farm for both people and for birds, bees, crickets, butterflies, dragonflies, fireflies. Ah, uh, yeah. almost firefly season. Oh, yeah, this is the place to come to see fireflies. Uh, the pitter-patter of tiny feet and huge combat boots. I'm assuming the fence is for the deer. Yes, and this is, uh, you know, another one of uh, the incredible uh, benefits of being in the Northampton Meadows is that flimsy fence is enough because there are no deer out here. <laughs> Last year we had a deer out here that was, I was attempting to chase away the frisbee, which did not work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but somebody that was a little more lethal than me found the deer because the remains of its leg were buried in the strawberry straw this winter. 
Oh, geez. Yikes. Yes, yes. Isn't that a farming tactic that some people use? Biodynamic? You yeah, have to, like, that's bury right. the horn of a, a dead animal in your field? That's right. right. That's a real thing, everybody. I, mean, I, did not, I didn't just make that up as a joke. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you fill the empty horn with cow poop and you bury it over winter so that it, it gathers the cosmic rays. Because there's more cosmic energy in the winter than in the summer. Now, I used to work on biodynamic farms, and I'm not uh, disagreeing with that theory. Interesting. Farming is, you know, it has to be sort of a blend of science and faith. Speaking of that, we're talking about all the bugs that are here on the farm. Tell us what the practices are you're employing to try to make sure that you've got a vibrant strawberry harvest year in and year out. They need to be rotated around the area here. And, you know, plants move. People don't realize that because plants move kind of slowly. But, Kalise, you're talking about lupins. Lupins move. Those ones we you saw up there, those were planted actually a few years ago, about 10 feet from where they are now. Oh, cool. So, but the strawberries, we help move. So each year we, we do about an acre and then we plow it under. And then we move to a different piece of land. And so we're trying to replace the strawberry with cover crops and, and native habitat to break the pest cycle and also to support the beneficial birds and bees. There's some secrets to growing strawberries, which I can't reveal on the radio because it's... Does it have to do with a dead horn and poop? No, <laughs> a de- uh, leg and some straw. Yeah, there you go. Well, let's just say that if you give strawberries milk products, they really, really like it. It's funny to think that plants actually like to eat animal products, but they do. Huh. Well. They, you know, you've heard of bone meal and blood meal, for example, but this is just my hint to other strawberry growers. <laughs> wow, I love that. They go well with milk in and out of the ground. Yeah. How does it work here? Do people come and pick their own, Kristen, at Pie in the Sky Farm in Northampton in the foot of they do. the Holyoke they Range? They come and pick their own strawberries, and we love it because a lot of times for kids, it's their first time they've ever actually been able to pick their own food and put it right in their mouth. That's amazing. And you also encourage that, too. It's not we cheating if you're sampling. picking. sampling. Yeah, okay, Absolutely. Good. How are they, Fred? I don't know. You be the judge. Yes. <laughs> everybody, everybody. Tough life, everybody. You tough eat life. Your own strawberry. Mmm. Oh. First strawberry of the season. What's the variety of this strawberry? That one is a Cavendish. Ooh. But this one <laughs> Phil Corman just got hit in the crotch by a flying <laughs> rotted strawberry. Are you okay, Phil? No, no, no. I'll try this one. I think this one's gonna be good. That's my guess. Mm-hmm. You a particularly little one? This... No, it's not the size. Really? The color. Um, it's a variety of things. It's. This variety is known for its good flavor. It's called mm. Early Glow. One of the secrets is, you see how there's white on the bottom of that strawberry? Yep. Yeah, you don't want that one. It's very tempting because the shoulders They look are so red. good, yeah. But you gotta have it red all the way around. Now, there's one that's red all the way around. Will those ones with the white bottoms get red all the yeah, way around eventually? So just be patient. And yeah. a little trick is if you're picking one that's ripe, it has a snap. Uh-huh. So it Sometimes. goes with the milk. It snap, <laughs> cra- crack the pop. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, the part of this complete breakfast that goes... It's weird now that I'm like, I've uh, the power of suggestion, tasting milky things when I'm eating these strawberries. They're right. still considered vegan, though, probably. So don't worry about it, everybody. Um, Monty, I was also going to say one thing about our farm is that we're in Northampton, meaning that we're in a community. So that obviously you have tons of community support, but you can ride your bike you can take the bus you can walk we had someone here who was staying out here who took a bus from boston and then walked here that's so cool so it's very close to the fairgrounds very close to the airport you can fly here we actually have some (laughs) friends who are pilots that flew from eastern mass to come and help us on the strawberry farm that is awesome so you can access the farm multiple different ways and it's a farm that's like in the community and close to people parachute in if you want parachute in there's a thousand acres to land in here no problem (laughs) absolutely just don't land on a strawberry. Yeah. yeah. Very careful walking around. Yeah, many children do. Oh, there's, this right. is the kind that really gets people oh. people going. Try that so one. So this Monty. one is giant shouldered, yeah, real the, big and fat. It's heart shaped. And that one it looks is, like a, a tuchus. <laughs> and I want to put it in my mouth. And I'm going to. Oh my god, this one's so delicious. Yeah. Okay, that one has a white bottom. Yeah. <laughs> look out for the white bottom ones. <laughs> About what? you saying, like, look for the white bottoms while bent over in a strawberry field. I'm just going to say. <laughs> I have no further comment at this time. What'd you get? What's this one, Kristen? It's another big, fat, red strawberry, <laughs> just like we like to see. No white bottom. Putting no it in. No white bottom. I feel like you're going to put Spinal Tap in there. Big bottom. Or, um, <laughs> Queen. Fat bottom girls, you make the rockin' world go round. Hey, look, is that dust in the wind? Ha, ha, ha.
all we are is dust in the wind, dude. And you maybe saw our entry sign. It's really our homage to one of the great bands of all times. The Beatles, Strawberry Fields Let forever. me take you down. Let me take you down. Organic, so we try different methods and one thing we have with these is we planted them amidst crimson and clover so it's also the beautiful plant not the farm that's not too far from here. <laughs> absolutely or the song uh. my band used to cover that and I would do the whole crimson and clover by hitting my throat like that live okay. it hurts one thing you'll also notice right next to us is we have these tall grasses. Oh, those are and this grass. is a uh, triticale, which is a, a rye wheat hybrid. And so we're always cover cropping to be able to help the productivity of the soil. So we never have any bare land here on the farm. We always have it covered with something that's positively helping it. How many types of strawberries are you growing on the farm? Um, We've already had like three different versions, which is cool. Yeah, we're currently growing five, but we usually have, and we've grown different varieties in the past. You know, we're, we're not sure how much the variety makes a difference. There are some flavor differences, but we're looking for plants that are hardy, especially to um, fungal diseases, and um, that just have a good vigor to them. We have not solved all the problems. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. We're, we're climbing Ignorance Mountain. <laughs> is that the name of that mountain right up over there? Yeah, and that's the false summit. There's the summit house of Ignorance Mountain. Oh no! <laughs> it sounds like a prediction for what's going to happen to us next year. Oh dear. Were you always going to be pick your own? Well we did try in the first couple of years we went to the Tuesday market which was great but we found that we were telling people who were driving up here on Tuesday please go away you can buy it from us in three hours at the Tuesday market. <laughs> and then we realized that that was kind of dumb. Fair enough. Still go to the Tuesday market in Northampton today though. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. So Farmer Fred at Pie in the Sky here in Northampton, right between the Connecticut River and the highway, do you use the water from the Connecticut for the irrigation here? We were lucky at first. We found that we have very shallow groundwater under the meadows. It's only 27 feet deep and 60 gallons a minute. So we could pump it for almost for free as much as we wanted until we got it tested and found out that it was contaminated by highway road salt. So yeah. it's actually unusable for any agricultural purpose or drinking. That's a bummer. Now it makes sense why they have low salt areas when you're on the highway, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, there's no inexpensive way to take the salt out once it's in the groundwater. So we, we would hope that in the future we'll figure out how to, how to keep the roads safe without basically poisoning our groundwater. This is um, a managed wild area between our strawberry patches. These are planted in a row. This is a whole bunch of different things that will be in flower this summer. Mountain mint, cone flower. Behind it, if you if you know plants, you might say, uh-oh, that's stinging nettle. But nettle's great for you though. Yes. Over here, I'm cutting down things which we don't want, such as um, Canada thistle. But I'm leaving things we do want, such as goldenrod and stinging nettle. So, and you can hear those birds, the birds love it, and the bees will be here all over these flowers uh, in a month or so. This one is a standby variety, which is late to, later to ripen, so it might have a hard time finding something actually ripe. Since the birds have already started on this one, they, they usually know what's good. Let's see yeah. what they say. Oh yeah, that's gonna be a good one. I'd give you a bite, but that's pretty gross. Yeah, the birds already <laughs> ate it, and Farmer Fred already ate it. That's too much. Dirty thirds. Also, it's human Dirty. nature, but our fields are really long, so we always encourage people to go all the way to the end because yeah. the further back you go, the more likely you're going to be able to That's find strawberries. Right. It's true when you have pick your own on your CSAs, too. Don't stand by the walkway. Like, go into yeah. the thing. That's, That's where the back. most of the good stuff still exactly. is. Phil Corman from CESA, how are other strawberry farmers faring this season from what you've been hearing? Because we did hear about the frost, and we know berries have been rough, but easier to cover strawberries and other types of fruit? I think, again, it always depends on where you're farming and what the temperature was. It did go down to 27 degrees in some spots for a number of hours a couple of weeks ago, depending if they were able to cover the crops. In general, that was okay, but we did lose a lot of blueberries again, and we did lose a lot of stone fruit. And as you mentioned, we lost the peaches in February. So we don't want to ignore the fruit that has come through the weather. Come get them. So here's a question for you all. What's your favorite thing to make with strawberries? Oh... What's your go-to? I, I mean, eat... my go-to is in my mouth and then they don't make it home. Same. Yeah. I'm not a big dessert person in general, but if somebody, if we have cream, I'm gonna have strawberries and cream. If we have shortcake, yeah. I'm not gonna make it, but if somebody's made it, I'm gonna have strawberry shortcake. Yeah. But I still, 
eating it on the way home is my preferred method. To me, it's strawberry rhubarb pie, and I freeze both so I can eat it whenever I want. Spinach feta salad. Oh, yeah. Also, like, making quick compotes to put on both vegetables and meats works very well. Strawberries are really versatile in that way because, like, they're sweet, but they're not too sweet. So, like, you can use them a lot in, like, more savory things, and they work as a very good foil. Yeah. Strawberry and goat cheese is also oh, delicious yeah. together. I love yep. some goat cheese. Yep. And then bake it in pastry. Like buy yourself some puff pastry because you're probably not going to take the eight hours it actually takes. <laughs> goat Eating che- the butter. It's, yeah. I mean, like I can't recommend a better way to get aggression out than trying to laminate dough because you will be there forever and you really do have to pound it. But also like spend the Lincoln at the, the grocery store and save yourself some time. But yeah, goat cheese and like or cream cheese or mascarpone and, and strawberries in puff pastry baked is also just wonderful. I think the bottom line is strawberry season is now. Now. Science and faith, people. Science Science and and faith. faith. Thanks again to Kristen Sykes and Fred Bedall from Pallion the Sky Farm in Northampton and Phil Corman from CESA. Up next, is a book ban coming to Ludlow or is this just a common sense way for parents to keep their kids safe? We'll talk to Jill Kaufman from the NEPM News Department who's been covering this story. And we'll talk with JJK, a Florence author whose book has been banned all over the country. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM, and I promise I'll explain what those letters mean. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. We're joined by the NEPM News Department's Jill Kaufman, who's been following a story out of Ludlow where the school committee is scheduled to vote on a controversial proposal that could significantly alter the types of books and media allowed in the district's libraries. It could also take away significant decision-making from librarians. And we're joined by Florence-based author Jarrett J. Krasowska, whose graphic memoir, Hey Kiddo, was shortlisted for the National Book Award and was also banned in many locations across the country. From the Boston Globe, a story by Adria Watson on May 22nd. In 2022, the American Library Association says it recorded the highest number of attempts to restrict library resources in school and public libraries in the 20 years the association has collected the information. The ALA documented 1,269 attempts to restrict library books and its resources in 2022, nearly double the 729 reported the previous year. Additionally, 2,571 titles were targeted for censorship, most of which were written by or about people of color and LGBTQ plus people, according to a statement released by the ALA in March. So the question will be, what is happening in Ludlow? And Jill Kaufman joins us. How did the Ludlow Public Schools arrive at this situation? Well, I think it's a lot what you are seeing when you're looking at the national um, horizon. Uh, We look beyond Ludlow and say we arrived at this moment in the U.S. Uh, There's a lot of politics involved uh, in what people believe about about what should and shouldn't be read, what kids should and shouldn't see. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of these proposals in the South and in Pennsylvania, which is where um, this proposal in Ludlow was modeled from. The ACLU says it's pretty much verbatim of the the, uh, Pennsylvania uh, policy, which is in a very um, red uh, part of the state, if not the you know the entire state being so. Um, so some of what is proposed in the policy in Ludlow would pull books that are about puberty, that are about um, that are young adult novels that depict sex uh, you know scenes of sexuality, um, that are books by Toni Morrison that might you know that might reveal um, uh, also scenes of abuse or rape uh, or you know or or many other things. But as as you were just reading before, Kalise, uh, that that these books that would be pulled are books from uh, um, writers um, and thinkers who are possibly, if not more likely, um, not accepted nationally as we see now, you know, in in the world of politics. So who in Ludlow is the one that is pushing for this? There is a school committee member in particular? Yes, there is. There's a a school committee member named um, Joao Diaz, and he proposed this policy. He said he found it online. He said he found it on Google is what he said. Uh Uh, And um, he says he, he... thinks he he proposed this policy now he did so early in may because he says it's needed we've had complaints ongoing for the past six years i think the chairman himself said that possible lawsuits from parents and that's a real thing and that's based on what's going on now not what might be from a civil liberties union that doesn't protect any civil liberties i the conversation that we're having right now uh, we 
got some uh, extra voices involved with. I did reach out to Joao Diaz to see if he uh, wanted to participate. It was short notice, so in all fairness, maybe we'll give him another opportunity. But another apparent was at these Ludlow School Committee meetings, Jill Kaufman from the NEPM News Department, who spoke passionately about this. Can you introduce us to this parent? Sure. Um, Bella Suarez is one of uh, many parents who spoke out, uh, uh, sorry, who spoke in favor of the of the policy. Um, she spent a portion of um, her time at the microphone, everybody had three minutes, uh, reading a passage from a novel, a young adult novel by John Green called Looking for Alaska. She read a scene depicting two teenagers in a in a sexual situation. Um, and and um, this was a book that has been challenged nationally in 2015, which means, as you discussed, it means that somebody um, said, I don't think it belongs in either a public library or a public school library. Um, so it was banned for sexually explicit descriptions, offensive language. Here she is talking to the audience which is other parents and teachers, and also some librarians. Get this all through your heads. You guys are the ones that are making it LGBTQ. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with pornographic books in our school. Drugs, rape, obscenity books. That's what we're trying to eliminate here. Now, in this conversation, and is Jared J. Krasowska, who's a Florence-based author who shortlisted for the National Book Award and whose graphic memoir, Hey Kiddo, has been banned. And you were part of this conversation in Ludlow back pre-panny, pre-pandemic, when a similar situation in Ludlow was coming up with similar types of books. Tell us your experience with that, Jared Krasowska. I tended to be physically there in support of the librarian so that they knew that I that they had support. They had support beyond what they might have been just hearing uh, from the, the louder minority of group that was there. Uh, and it's interesting to to hear uh, what that one parent uh, read at the school committee meeting, because this is what we're seeing across the country, where you take one small passage taken out of context and described as whole of the book. Yep. Now, uh, these books aren't pornographic. Por you know, pornography is specifically created to titillate and excite and create, you know, sexual satisfaction. Uh, these are scenes in books that uh, deal with the very heavy topics that teens are dealing with. And uh, I would encourage all of those parents to read the book as whole. Now, we see that a lot with graphic novels, with social media, where one single panel is taken out of context. Now, of course, every parent has the right to say what their kid should or should not read, but they certainly do not have the right to restrict materials from other students. Well, now, Jared, and, you're, you're an author and a parent. Are there things that you don't want to see in your children's school library? Or should the sky be the limit in a school library? I think that, I mean, no. I mean, because we have librarians who have degrees in curating books for their collections. These are professionals. These are professionals who are trained to know what books are being published. And um, as a parent, I know that my children will be confronted with so many difficult truths in their lives. And I would much rather them first learn of those experiences through the safety of a book. Jill, Co and, Jill Coffin from the no, NEPM News Department. What's the next step here in Ludlow? A week from today, there's a meeting. What do we anticipate is going to happen? We're anticipating that uh, that this won't pass. But that, that was just from gleaning at the last meeting that three out of the five uh, school committee members said that they were not in favor. Um, uh, they were not in favor of this policy um, and that there's a policy that exists that, yes, it could be better. It could be more efficient. There is an email um, aspect to the policy currently now that any parent can get on an email list that alerts them to what their kids would like to take out before they take it out. So there are many things that do work. But the challenging policy, they say, yeah, it took us a year to get back to a certain parent. Yes, it doesn't work. There, there's so much more to say, uh, everyone, uh, but I, I know we're, we're almost out of time. But there, you know, there is a question here. What about the parents who are really concerned about their kids who are not caught up in the fray of this. They're just concerned parents. NEPM's Jill Kaufman and Jared J. Krasowska, award-winning author from Florence, Massachusetts. Thank you both so much. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, extra bonus live music Wednesday. We'll hear Levosin and Leviosin and chat about the evolution of modern Jewish music. Plus, Polly Byers of the Karuna Peace Center joins us to chat about the Brave Schools program. And the word nerd leads us into the histories of some colloquialisms at the suggestion of one of our listeners. Our director is Tony on Ryan Duty Dunn. Our engineer is Betsy. Did you miss us yesterday, Langto? Our technical team is Bart. Scrap the whole thing and start over Rankin Kara Dude. Dude, Foster, and Punk Rude Boy Dubay. Thanks to Spouse Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Suitcase Junket, Tommy Jame, and the Sean, <laughs> Sean Dells, Spinal Top Queen, The Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, The Brass, The Brady Brunch Theme, Weezer, and the late Astrid Gilberto. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Khalees Smith. See you tomorrow on The Fabulous 413.